violence is quite easy to get desensitized to in an odd way. But hearing someone suffering in a very intimate way was devastating because you would hear their stories and you would see and you just thought you're not going to survive here. The crux of your book, a bit of a stretch, which I usually talk about in the intro and outro just to get people to, to, to read, but I just loved it so much that I'm, I'm mentioning it now as well because it was just a fantastic read. Hope you don't mind I had my girlfriend read it as well. She's obsessed Perfect. with it. She loved it. She she really liked it. She, she wanted to come in and say hello, and then she's, she's too shy, so she's not going to say hello. Um, <laughs> but yes, uh, I was going to ask, so would you, would you say the crux of the book is about how uh, a middle-class person survives prison? Is that what makes it different to a standard prison book? Um. I think, I mean, it, it, it's trying to do several things. One is that, it's the personal journey of middle-class lefty media twat ends up in prison mostly through his own fault and and how he kind of has to get his shit together and survive it. Um, there's not many people in my situation, so I, 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 I thought if, if it was purely a book for the other lefty media twats who might get done by the MN Revenue, that's quite a small audience. But it was also the broader story is uncovering the true effect of underfunding and dysfunction in the prison system and why that is a bad thing, not just for the prisoners, but for everyone else in society. Um, and, and to sort of say, this is the raw, unvarnished horrors of what's actually going on behind these normally kind of closed doors, because the, the prison system is very opaque. It hates scrutiny. It hates observers. It certainly doesn't let journalists come in and wander around for nine months, which is essentially what I was doing. So it, it's, it's a kind of behind the scenes at the same time and I think that's that's the bigger picture really mm. it, did that help you get get through your time there as well sort of that that journalist thing of that mask of I'm in here as a journalist it's okay oh yeah, oh, yeah. I just turned told myself I was here for research purposes and then it became like a job and that was that was far easier to cope with than you know your life's fucked and you're banged up in prison for the next two and a half years so I uh absolutely and in in my personal professional work I'm um I mostly do documentaries. So now I happen to be an author, thanks to this prison experience. But um, my my normal kind of day job is documentaries. And I always feel very protected when I have a camera. I was actually filming in Switzerland this week and I was up in a cable car and I, I hate heights. I can't stand heights. So I just got the camera and said, well, I'm just going to start filming now because I'll feel safe if I'm filming. If I'm not filming, I'm going to be terrified. So it's the same inside. I got a pen and paper and sort of started writing down. I thought, right, I'm, I'm research. Isn't that amazing? I, I've had similar experiences when I'm filming things and you look back later and you go, I would never do. And people go, God, he was so brave to be in that place. And I think I would never, I'm the most scared person in the world of everything. But as soon yeah. as you've got that camera on you, it's like you're a different person, aren't you? And socially as well, like I'm, I'm socially quite reserved and shy and awkward. But if I've got a camera, I can walk up to anyone and start talking to them. So it's it's probably the same inside, actually, that, that feeling of, oh, I'm here, slightly undercover. No one really knows that I'm going to be doing this. And that that gave me just a kind of confidence that I probably wouldn't have had otherwise. I suppose we should tell listeners what, what you actually did um, and, and, and to, to get into prison and in a way that, that somebody who doesn't know anything about anything, which is me, could understand. Well, there's, there's the, the, the long version, which has gone for several years and probably bore your audience to tears. Um, and there's the very short version um, for context, which is, I, I was very fortunate. I started producing films when I was very, very young. Um, and I'm, what, 45 now. And so I started my first film as a producer. I think I was 24 or something. So I was, I was very fortunate. And at that time, we're talking about 20 years ago, the, there was a huge amount of tax money flooding the film industry in the sense that uh, bankers, celebrities, footballers would put a certain amount of money into some slightly quirky, dubious tax investment schemes. And the middlemen involved in these schemes would punt some of that money down to us, the producers. We would get a film made. Thank you very much. Um, and and the, the rich people would avoid a huge amount of tax. And, and this was sort of abused as a system, really, from the outset. And there was a huge amount of money sloshing around. And, and, and there, a culture really developed within the industry of inflating budgets and people kind of cooking the books a bit to make the budgets bigger. So we get more money to make a better film and the celebrities or whoever would avoid more tax. And it was a sort of a free for all, really. And then over time, the Inland Revenue or HMRC, as they became, started closing down a lot of these schemes, quite rightly, because the Chancellor was losing too much money over it. And, and so the scheme started doing, in a sense, more and more darker things in order to circumvent the tax laws. And I was involved in one of those said schemes that crossed that sort of impenetrable line, really, from legal, morally repugnant tax evasion into... Sorry, so they cross the line from legal, morally repugnant tax avoidance into criminal tax evasion, 
and we kind of got swept up in it really and it took years and years for it to come to court um and a whole bunch of people got prosecuted of which i was one and um it's the conspiracy to cheat public revenue is a technical uh, offence, which basically tax fraud, and uh, I, and I got I got five years for it. It's a weird one because it is sort of, and I'm not saying it's just like because I'm talking to you now, but it's the kind of thing that I probably just would have done. I, I could have got swept up in that because I wouldn't have understood it. And I would just, some people would have said, "Do you want to do this?" And I'd have gone, "Is that against the law?" And they'd have gone, "Not really." And I'd gone, "Well, it, can, it lets me. I can do a documentary out of it. Then why not?" Right? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, and, and look, the thing is, I don't want to sort of play play the world's smallest violin for me, you know. What I, and I do thoroughly accept that what we did was wrong, and 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 you know we shouldn't have done it, and probably deserved what we got. Um, it, it, you know, in my own head at the time, I thought it was okay because I was getting the money; it was all getting spent on a film. Like, it was a rather good film that got a huge amount of critical acclaim. So I thought, well, that's okay then, as long as the film's good. It doesn't, you know, really matter where you get the money from. And I always thought to myself, well, if I ever have to answer for this, I can just show them the film and go, look at this lovely review in the Sunday Times. And, <laughs> and that's OK. And yeah. in, in the cold light of a courtroom, that doesn't that doesn't really work. You know, and the thing is, it all we were doing it before the financial crash and austerity. And then the financial crash and austerity happened. And people saw what happened when you cut funding for schools and hospitals and all this public services stuff. And and tax avoidance and evasion is a big part of that. So my films were all about kind of exposing wrongdoing. In other people and if you do that you've got to expect that to happen to you you've got to hold yourself to the same standard and we kind of came short really well i suppose when you say you deserved it i i i, I imagine you mean just relative to you know anyone else who deserves it but there's a lot of thought and i think in your book as well behind the the, the, the fact that prisons are pretty useless and they sort of serve as these these punishments and stuff and you know did you or do other people do people deserve unless they've you know, have done a violent crime. Do they really? Do they deserve to be locked up away for years? I, th- I look. I th- that's a whole other debate in terms of, you know, what I, I try and remove myself from that element of the debate by saying, look, I think I deserve a punishment. I broke the law. Probably deserve some time in prison for it. How much I should have spent is sort of for other people to decide. In general, though, sentence lengths have been going up and up and up. Um, and there's a lot of studies done on this that show that since the sort of late 1990s, really, when New Labour came to power, there was like an arms race of sentencing. So whenever something bad happened, whenever there was some terrible crime, what does the politician say? Increase sentences, tougher sentences. And, and the studies show that increasing sentences doesn't cut crime. Because when people in general break the law, it's, it's a spontaneous act, largely driven through environmental pressures. And they don't sit there going, oh, I've been looking at the sentencing guidelines recently, and actually it's now eight years for this rather than six years for this. I might not do it. It's, it's, it's not what goes through people's heads. So the, the idea that sending people away for longer and longer and longer acts as a deterrent is fundamentally flawed, and all the studies show that. What it does do is it sort of satiates the public anger about something and shows that the politician is doing something even though the thing they are doing is ineffective yeah i think that as well it's it's you know do we want reform or do we just want to punish we have that human need to punish hey to take me to like the moment you realized uh this is not you know just a film i've made and i've done something that's a bit cheeky but i'm gonna i might go to prison i might face time what was how did that happen i got arrested well they just turned I up got arrested but yeah yeah they just turned up they don't tell you unfortunately um they just they just come and knock on your door so yeah that that was that was the moment and that was that was years before i actually went to prison for it so there was a huge time lag between the arrest which was tra- shocking and traumatizing and everything else and then actually getting charged which was two years later so between arrest and charge you might know it's not nothing's public nothing might not happen those people get arrested and nothing happens and then it's charged and then is your case going to go to trial there were three trials before mine so we were kind of quite low down on the indictments they kept prosecuting all these other people first and we were watching and these trials were gone for months so we were just sitting waiting and then they say no you're definitely going to go to trial and then there's another sort of six months so it was four and a half years between arrest and the, the actual court case by which time you're saying please can we have this can we get this over and done with i just can't the uncertainty was awful it was terrible and people often say well what what happened when what did you feel when you were convicted and sent to prison i said well there's a huge relief in a way because that period of uncertainty had stopped and that had been a hugely kind of negative uh, uh force on, on me personally professionally and everything so actually even just that stopping and the next phase which had a specific end date albeit two and a half years in the future was at least underway and i could start ticking off the days so when they did turn up um 
and a, and arrest you. So they turn up and arrest you, and then they let you go home, and then there's two years. Is that how it works? And then the exactly, court. yeah. I, I wasn't remanded or anything like that. No, no, because it's financial crime. So they, they, it's only when someone's there's a danger, the threat to the public and stuff like that. So if if you've you know you've shot someone or might have shot someone, they generally remand you. But for a financial crime. Unless they think you're going to skip the country, they don't remind you. So that moment when they came in, I mean, that was obviously shocking and unexpected for you. And like, how did that feel in that moment? No, oh, it was it was crushing. There was a huge amount else going on in my life at the same time. I, my and my partner was pregnant with our child. We were just moving house. I was also undercover on a, on a dispatches for Channel Four because I used to do a lot of undercover investigative journalism, investigating a whole range of really really corrupt people. So there was a feeling as well that maybe the two are related. And when you're undercover, you kind of go mad anyway. So here I was undercover investigating a load of people for breaking the law. And here was I was being arrested for breaking the law for something kind of completely different. It was um it was a bit of a head fuck. Yeah. I can I can imagine that that moment and you're just the concerns about people calling you a hypocrite and that kind of thing. And oh my God, your world just turned upside down in that second i suppose but, but nobody knew that was the mad thing no one knew initially you just arrested and they go okay well we'll see you in whenever and then so in a sense it was like a secret but then you you were worried that that secret would get out so you were always terrified every time the phone rang i thought that's that's the daily mail going what's this about you being arrested so it was that feeling as well it was good in a way because i could keep working i kept working for two years doing those kind of investigative shows but terrified that one that someone would just leak out because all the phone hacking stuff had happened was happening then at the same time. And I was giving evidence to the Leveson inquiry. So I wasn't the tabloid's best friend because I was giving evidence against them. And they were all paying off cops and stuff to let the tabloids know when people had been arrested. And so there was just it was just this whole kind of mess of different different things going on. So yeah, I'm glad that all that bit is over. Very glad. And it always culminated in you getting to prison and seeing of all people, and we should explain, I'll let you explain who he is for, I guess, suppose American listeners, but Max Clifford is just there. And you had, you had interviewed him before. I I turned him over. Yeah. So Max Clifford was a, a, you can Google him if you want. He was a sort of very uh, powerful celebrity publicist who had a finger in uh, a large number of pies and was notorious for well one being a bit of a sex pest and two being a blackmailer and and just thoroughly thoroughly corrupt he was very very powerful with the industry years and years before in fact in the film that i took bent money to make a film called star suckers i had gone and filmed him i've done an interview with him but then when the camera stopped he thought the interview was over but i still had a secret camera running he then started coming out with all this stuff basically about his darker practices, which we all secretly filmed. And we put that in the film to try and expose him. And then not long afterwards, there was a whole load of sex scandals happened and he was like arrested and charged with sex crimes. And my evidence was used against him in order to help send him down. And then he had been in prison for a while and he was then charged with a load of new sex crimes. So when I was convicted and sent down to the cells beneath the court, he was in the next cell. And I sort of went and waved and said hello. And he thought I'd gone down there to torment him. And I said, no, no, don't worry, I've been done too. And he had, we had a bit of a laugh about it. So, yeah, it was the, that was on the first day. That was the, And my journey kept getting... That, that set the level for how surreal my de- journey through prison was. And it sort of continued in that vein thereafter. So then you got into prison. Talk us through your first day, your first moment, your first days. Yeah, I mean, Wandsworth was sort of... At the time when I arrived, it, uh, the, the officer told me... As I walked in, he said, this is the largest prison in Europe. It's the second most overcrowded prison in the UK. And it has the highest suicide rate in the UK. That's That was my introduction to it. And I was like, God, we're not in Kansas anymore. Um, and the, the induction wing was basically just, it is essentially a lunatic asylum because a huge number of the people on the, this first wing you go into have severe mental health problems. And a lot of them have just come inside and on the outside of prison, they all take a huge amount of drugs and they come into prison. And of course, that drug supply stops initially and they go through cold turkey. So that makes them even more agitated. So it's it's like this deafening wall of noise of people kind of screaming and kicking their cell doors. And the people running around the landings were just absolutely terrifying. So I was just absolutely rooted to the spot. I just couldn't really believe I was there. You just get this weird out of body experience. It's just like, I'm not actually here. And then I was very fortunate. I was then moved, I was then told to go into a cell with a guy who fortunately had been to prison quite a lot. He was in his sort of sixties by this stage and he was very calm. 
And he just like nothing phased him whatsoever. And because he'd been through the system a few times, he kind of knew how the place worked or didn't work. But he did sort of take, he could see I was a complete fish out of water. So he took me under his wing a bit and, uh, and made sure I was kind of okay for those first few nights. So I was extremely grateful for that. They say that everybody they cries the first night or, or something, and and at this point, I, mean, I believe you were addicted to sleeping pills and and uh, wine and things. Unless it, I don't know if that was tongue in cheek or not. No, I mean I, I I wouldn't I wouldn't classify myself as a definite addict, but I'd just been I'd just been through a very very traumatizing trial, and I always say the trial is worse than prison. Like my life got much much better once I got to prison, which I know sounds mad, but trial the trial was horrible in every way. Well, at least in prison. You can just lie in your bunk and watch telly. You know, there's, it's not it's not stressful. The stress of the trial was immense. So during the trial, I couldn't sleep at all. So the only way I could get to sleep was by taking kind of half a sleeping pill at night and drink a bottle of wine. Um, so I was doing that every day during the trial. So once I got to prison, that stopped, which is good. I kind of cleaned myself up. Um, and no, this whole thing about people crying on the first night, it's different for different people because I felt enormous relief. I felt very good. I felt like... because. I'd, I'd had a week between conviction and sentencing and barristers do their job, which is prepared for the worst. So my barrister had said you could get, I think about eight years at one point that they were kind of, they were going, they, they were going absolutely hell for leather to, to put me away for as long as possible. And the judge kind of saw sense and gave me five, which was about right. So I think the fact that I'd only got a five was a huge bonus because I thought I was going to get much longer. And, and in Britain, everyone, um, so you serve half the sentence before you're allowed out to serve the rest of the sentence in your community. So you divide everything by two. So I thought five years, two and a half. I knew I'd have to spend about six to nine months in a closed, horrible prison before I got to open prison when you can start going out and seeing your family and stuff. So I thought, well, I'm only going to be here till Christmas. It was July. And I thought, well, I'll be out just after Christmas of this place and go to somewhere much nicer. So already I was thinking, well, July, you know, you can sort of you can see that in the future. So I was thinking, ah, maybe this isn't so bad. And as I said, I, I was hugely relieved that the trial was over and this whole massive period of uncertainty had come to an end. And you talk about, um, again, being you know a lefty liberal and, and sort of middle class. And obviously that I relate to that because I'm similar in that sense, you know, and I'm reading that. And we do, I, I'm careful about talking about it as well and asking you this question because I don't, I don't mean at all to suggest that uh, working class people all go to prison or anything like that. But I imagine prisons are uh, more working class people and fewer middle class people. Right. And, and so, so do people respond to you differently f- f- for that? No, not really. I think or they did, but not how you'd expect. So all my expectations of prison had come from popular culture, which, of course, were completely wrong. Like the portrayal of prisons in the media is just always be it the news or be it in fiction is just laughably wrong and incorrect. Um, and actually, people did, but not in the way you'd expect, because. A huge number of prisoners are illiterate or functionally illiterate. They think about 50% of prisoners can't read and write. And prisons are really, really archaic and run on very um, old uh, administrative system, which everything is written out by hand on bits of paper. So if you want anything done, you have to fill out an application form, which is in triplicate, you know, with the old carbon copy. Sheets. And I hadn't seen this since I was at school. I was like, this is, I remember having to fill in chits to go to the town at my school because I was at public school. And, and you had to fill in these forms and get three different staff to sign them or something. We all forged the signatures or whatever. And you had pink slips and yellow slips. And that was in like the 80s. And I hadn't seen, like everything's digital, right? I don't even have much paper in my office. And then you suddenly go to prison and there's no IT whatsoever. And everything's done on carbon copies. So if, if a prisoner wants anything at all, be it some extra food or a visit from their girlfriend or to get some shoes or whatever, you've got to fill in a form many, many times. And if they can't read or write, they're in trouble. So they would come to middle class prisoners like myself quite sort of humbly and say, could you fill in this form for me? And you go, yes, yes, OK. And it's so and that has started happening quite early on and and continued until the day that I left. I was constantly doing ad. If anyone asked me nicely, I would. And I'd never asked for anything in return. And, and I just filled in lots of forms for people. And that it, so there was a weird sort of respect there if you help them and you were nice that and then they'd tell their mate and then if you ever needed anything they would always help you because you'd help them so it was it was it was your your education was quite valuable well that was i think a lot of what you're saying was the crux of the book and it and, and the humor in the book there's a lot of humor in the book uh and it, i suppose you could call it python-esque or kafka-esque you know the whole just you're filling out a form to fill in a form to fill in uh, a form it gets thrown in the bin and you know no one reads it <laughs> <laughs> and just you're trying to get like transferred to another place and like no because of this slight bureaucratic mad yeah, thing yeah yeah 
there was one thing that had me belly laughing. Actually, well, actually, I should be honest. I had my girlfriend belly laughing, and she woke me up because she's a faster reader than me, so she was well ahead of me. Um, about Shawshank and the showers. Do you remember what that? What what that was? What you wrote? I'm just trying to remember now. Which just <laughs> it was. What it was is. Um, I did write it on it. Just remind. <laughs> <laughs> I believe you wrote it. I'll ask my ghostwriter. <laughs> yeah. No, how can, how can you remember every sentence in the book? It's ridiculous. But I remembered it because I just laughed so much. But it was about, uh, I think you were either all watching Shawshank or something like that. And I think it was you, or it might have been another prisoner at the time, who said something. It was like a, a rape scene in the showers. And rather than focus on the rape, it was like, God, they've got real better water than us. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, weirdly, so because you had these tellies. And because you're locked, you, you, so you're trapped in your cell a lot. That's the other thing they don't tell you is you're locked in your cell for days on end sometimes. And, and but you did have a TV, and but you would only it got into certain terrestrial channels. There was a lot of politics about prisoners watching Sky Sports. You can't, which I don't watch sports, so I was fine. But you're like, you can't bring watching Sky Sports. But one of the channels you'd get free to air channels was Film Four. So Film Four was on. So if there was a film that was on Film Four, it was on like every day that week so you'd end up watching these films over and over and over so Shawshank was on I love the film I watched especially as you're in prison you watch it through new eyes and we would have a game where we watched the film or anything with prisons in and we would like try and compare how those facilities were to our own and Shawshank okay yes Tim Robbins does get raped in the showers but the water pressure in those showers was excellent <laughs> and we're going to our showers and this kind of little mediocre dribble would come out and we were like there's better showers in Shawshank or he gets, he also gets raped in the laundry and they've got like really good laundry <laughs> that works. And we were like, our laundry just doesn't work and everything's falling apart. Their laundry looks great. So yeah, it was a little, little very dark game we played. I love that. I, lo- I love that. I love the idea that people are in prison watching films about prison while filling out those forms we talked about where forms and forms and forms, movies about movies, about movies, about life. And I'm writing a book about it as well. It- it's like, out, yeah, endless, relentlessly meta. And but the, but thinking of that those those Shawshank scenes, the, I can't recall many or any scenes of real sort of violence where you feared feared for your life or anything like that. Was did anything like that kick off? No, and it, it, again, it's that it's like the, the the questions people always ask you when you get out, and it's normally ones about the food, and others about the showers, and others about the violence. Right, so violence was everywhere. It was a very violent place, but it was all. I don't violence that was targeted, but violence often happening for a reason. There was very little indiscriminate violence. So someone would just walk along and just hit the first person they saw. The violence was predominantly about debt. So there's obviously a vast amount of drugs in prison. I joke that it's easier to get heroin in prison than it is to get a paracetamol. Um, and you get a lot of drug dealers, you get a lot of drug addicts, you put them all in one place and, hey, presto, there's a massive drugs trade. And... People would get drugs of spice was the kind of the drug du jour because it was um, very, very easy to smuggle in. And you What can't... spice? Spice is a synthetic form of cannabis. So you can make it in a bucket in your garage. People do. And it doesn't smell. So sniffer dogs can't smell it. And it doesn't show up on drugs tests because they keep altering the, the combination of the chemicals in it. So to me, that it just doesn't show up on drugs tests. Um, so there's a huge amount of it about and a huge amount of debt so people would get some drugs from a dealer and they'll say well i'll pay you at the end of the week when the canteen which is like the prison shop comes in i'll give you some tobacco or some food or something off the canteen but then they take those drugs and go well, one another here they go to another dealer and tick that and, they would, and they're t- ticking stuff on debt all week and then of course they couldn't pay everyone so they'd end up owing these dealers money which wasn't a very good idea and then they'd get beaten up so that was the predominant driver of violence now if you don't loan anyone drugs or you don't take drugs or borrow drugs then you're out of that system basically and if you don't go around annoying people and go around kind of helping people which is what i did because there's a huge amount of people in all sorts of distress um that i would help if, if they asked that you could kind of make yourself quite useful and so i witnessed violence on such a level that i got totally desensitized to it but violence at me I never, I was never struck. No one ever hit me, and it, it was vanishingly rare for someone to actually directly threaten me. It did. It happened a couple of times, but the, but the one time it sort of happened, I had three like very large, serious people come up to me afterwards and say, "Do you want him sorted out? We'll sort him out for you." Because I'd help them get their kids on visits. So I'd help them a lot do things, and and I said, "No, no, leave him. Don't kill him. He's all right. We're just having a bad day." Um, so, I, you know, I ended up being friends with people who, not deliberately, but they were quite sort of 
heavy gangsters. So if you're in the, with those sorts of circles, then you generally get left alone. I, th- I mean, I think the thing, the, the one thing I'd stress as well, if people are going to listen to this and then possibly go and think about the book, is that like it, prisons are extraordinarily awful, violent, stressful, traumatic places, but they're also very, very funny. And I, I always said that, that I found it like I was given front row seats for like the world's darkest farce in real time. And all I could do was write it down. And so there was um, there was a group of Muslims on <clears throat> my wing um, who all joined Alcoholics Anonymous, even though they were completely strictly teetotal. They would uh, they all went to the AA meetings because it was the way that they could all get to hang out with their mates because they were locked in their cells all day uh, otherwise. And there was another guy on my wing who was notoriously um, racist, uh, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, all the phobes, basically. And they put him in charge of equalities. He was like the equalities <laughs> officer on the wing. He went to if you had suffered discrimination, most of which was coming from him. Um, so it was weird. There was they, they had all these mad courses for people. You couldn't get loo roll half the time, but you could go on these courses to sort of improve yourself, which mostly were completely pointless. And the governor was really big on mindfulness. He wanted all the prisoners to start doing mindfulness because he thought, you know, we'd all stop committing crimes if we did. So he set up a mindful co- my, he set up a mindfulness course called tunneling and everyone signed up to it because they thought they can learn how to dig tunnels and it wasn't until they got there and they had to control their breathing they realized they've been sold a pup so this was like a day stuff like this happened like every day in front of me and i was like i couldn't i could never write this a writer i would never come up with this stuff so i put it all down and put it in the book so the book isn't a long diatribe about prison reform it's basically just like a black farce it's really funny how i, I suppose i'm always caught out by how narcissistic i am as a sort of presenter and stuff because i'm listening to you and the whole time i'm thinking like not that i'm planning to go to prison what would i do how would yeah, I do? Well, yeah exactly yeah. exactly like and i'm thinking like if i end up there okay make friends with people uh be helpful and all that stuff don't get involved in the drugs at all you'll be fine You'd be absolutely fine. You'd be like me. You'd, you'd, you'd shit yourself for a few weeks and then you'd start coping. Then you'd be fine. And then you could then realise how to use the dysfunction for your own advantage. And that's when you start. You get in like the top tier slipstream when you actually realise you know the system better than any of the other officers or any of the, the prisoners there. And you can actually manipulate their own calamities to your advantage and have an easier life. All that stuff you hear, I suppose it's in movies and things about like, you know, getting in, you've got to show who you are when you get this, you've got to punch someone. Do you know, maybe that's American prisons or is it just fiction? I, I, I Look, it would be very different. If I was a young, young man from an ethnic minority who'd been part of a street gang, those street gangs, all their beefs and rivalries and territory disputes carried on inside the prison. They, it was seamless in and out of the prison walls. So if you're in gang A and you're at war with gang B outside the prison, you get in the prison, that war's still happening. So that is very difficult to extricate yourself from. And I would deal, talk about this in a bit, but I ended up being a listener, which is basically like an in-prison counsellor. And I dealt with a lot of lads who were in some massive beef and they were worried for their lives, essentially. And I, my heart went out to them because I was like, here am I, some 40-year-old white dude. And everyone sort of ignores me. I sort of slipped through the shadows because I'm not seen as a rival I wasn't a threat so yes I think for younger people going in there was a thing of you need to prove yourself and people would attack other people because it was like well that's that postcode gang we've got a beef with them let's go and have a fight and 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 people get sucked into violence that way um so yeah it's 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 a lot easier for me to sit here and go I could just breeze through it wouldn't have been the case if I was a 19 year old young black boy from a, 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 a really damaged estate that was part of a street gang. He couldn't just walk in and go, I'm, I'm going to behave in here and, and not get sucked into violence. It's much harder for that. And when these fights were happening, were you sort of like, just going to slip back into my cell and close the door? No, you just watch. I mean, it was, it was awful. It's kind of entertaining. You'd, you'd, you'd just, you'd, or you'd just walk. Through, you wouldn't. It's really difficult to describe. And it makes me seem exceptionally callous. But I went, I worked on the, that induction wing I was telling you about, which we called Beirut because it was so violent and mad. I, I was on there for a few weeks when I first arrived. And after a while, I got a job there. So one of my job, I did loads of different jobs in the prison because it got me out of my cell. It carried me favor. And it meant as a journalist, I could walk around and observe all these different elements of it going, the place going wrong. So one of my jobs was um, 
the induction orderly, which meant I dealt with new prisoners as soon as they, they came in. And there you got basically got to meet every new person coming into the jail, which, as I say, as a journalist, was just amazing um, access. And that wing was just like a war zone. And it got to a point where I'd walk from, because my mate had a cell downstairs and I'd get a cup of tea from him. So I'd get in, I'd sort of sort my desk out, get the tests ready. Um, and then I'd go and get a cup of tea and I'd walk back and there'd be all these fights going on. And the trick was getting back and just to not spill my tea. So my aim was just get back and, and I would step over these officers jumping down and batons waving and all that. And you're just like, oh, don't want to spill my tea. And it just became like I walked to the shops here back at home. And it just didn't face. Now, that's not a good thing, but your body does do that. Otherwise, if you get shocked by violence every 20 minutes, you're going to spend all day a nervous wreck. So your body deliberately acclimatizes you and desensitizes you to what you're seeing. Just imagining you in there sort of day to day. And and is there also, you, you've spoken of the relief when you first got in because there's no more uncertainty, but also daily life when you're on the outside is full of sort of this uncertainty. What should I do with my life? Where am I going with my career? How's my relationship? That kind of thing. D- did Was that also a bit of a relief putting that on hold and to the side? It wasn't conscious, but you certainly don't spend all day walking around going, oh my God, I'm in prison. I'm, I'm here for the next two and a half years. Where is me? There was a bit of that, especially at the start. But because... In a way, it helped because it was so dysfunctional, because even at the start, I got better as time went on. Like I said, I got to a point where I was like, I understood the dark arts of prison so well, I kind of get everything I needed in there. But it's first the first few months, like getting a phone call, getting a shower, getting the visits, getting out the cell, getting something half decent to eat was such a challenge. You would spend hours on those tasks. <laughs> the thing like that, that's your first 20 minutes of the day, right, at the moment. That was a whole day could be taken up focusing on those things. And it became like a game. And, 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 and if you got out, you got that shower, you got the phone call, you got a nice bit of supper. You just felt like oh, you're on cloud nine. You'd like you'd want a prison. And then you think, right, tomorrow, we've got to do the same tomorrow. How are we going to get out? How are we going to get a shower? And, 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 and if you approached it that way, that became kind of all consuming. And you stopped worrying about the smaller stuff. And and or, or you're sort of worrying about the small stuff. You're sort of worrying about the bigger picture as well. Because if you worry about the bigger picture all the time, you're just going to have a breakdown. Yeah, I can, I can imagine that. And I, I feel like I got a tiny bit of that, you know, lockdown, of course. And I've had moments in my life where I've had very, very little going on in terms of work and stuff like that. And I, I definitely noticed that a shower, even though it was easy for me to get compared to what, you know, I could just walk in the shower. It was like a big part of my day. It's like, oh, I've had the shower. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. In lockdown, it's like going to the shops. I'm going to buy milk soon. That'll be exciting. <laughs> Your world closes in yeah no your world closes in to fill the space that is given to you and you do quite quickly adapt and i suppose a lot of the book is about adaptability and and how you can the human body and mind will very very quickly change to the circumstances that's in there and you just get on with it you're not spending your whole time walking around i have to think about this in times of history you know you look back at the history books and you look at like life in 1850 and it looks terrible these people are having a terrible time, but they don't look, they weren't all moaning about it. They weren't going, here I am in 1850, it isn't life shit, isn't our life expectancy terrible? You know, isn't child mortality awful? Because it was just normal to them. They just thought, this is the world I'm in, let's just get on with it. No, like They had like eight babies die, didn't they? And every, everything smelled bad. And obviously it was traumatising, I don't want to downplay that, but at the same time, they people, you do just get on with it. And it's very comforting to know that, you know, the human mind and body is much more resilient than we give it credit for, maybe. How, did did being in prison your films and documentaries before were about exposing i suppose to, to simplify it baddies and things um did, did was there a sense of you know the he who is without sin did did you become uh judge people less harshly maybe after prison or did that change at all yes and i i, I, I apart from in very odd circumstances I, I kind of resolved to not go back to a life of finger pointing um which is essentially what investigative journalism is. Oh, has been really... What investigative journalism is, is going and trying to find someone who's done something wrong and kind of make it out to be, you know, the crime of the century and and yell and scream and judge them in public. And that's essentially what journalism kind of is. Or certainly that's how I, how I was feeling it was. So I did certainly become a lot less judgmental. And this idea of you have good guys and bad guys and bad guys have done something wrong, you've got to punish them as much as possible. That did certainly all change and i think it's more interesting to look at like the systemic faults and say look this system is broken and what can you do to fix the system that will therefore make everyone's lives easier be it the 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 offenders but also the public and the victims as as well and to try and 
I suppose understand that there's no this this weird trade off between offender and victim is is completely bogus sort of equivalence. This idea that you make you make the situation better for the victim by making life worse for the offender that that, that there's this kind of inverse equivalence to them is is, is just nonsense really. Because if, if you smash up the offender too much, they walk out and commit crime immediately, and then there's a whole new set of victims. And it was that that was my kind of eureka light bulb moment, which went against everything I'd thought of before, which is bad people go to prison, they get punished and they don't do it again. You know, that's just like it's such <laughs> a bogus premise. Yeah, I think that's the the stigma, isn't it? If you stigmatize and you label somebody as a monster, then they're just like, there's no incentive anymore to not be a monster. If everyone just says you are. Get on with it. Crack on. Keep being <laughs> a monster. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's one of the hardest things I find about journalism. I think I, I really like what you're saying about try and aim at the systems because I, I, I don't want to upset anyone I don't want to I very rarely have these interviews on the podcast and say you did a bad thing that I wouldn't have done I was just reading an article the other day in the Guardian about Ricky Gervais and the guy had it was one of these profiles of him but it, it was a takedown it was a real big takedown and I just thought you've sat down with the guy who's nice enough to give you his time for an hour and you've just absolutely torn him apart and I just thought in journalism I don't know how to square that anymore but I think what I was I would then ask you what would you and I think what you're saying about go at the systems that- yeah I think and you know and you can use personal narratives to do that but I think what I was sort of trying to do in the book was like by and large I wasn't sort of saying oh here's this prisoner what an asshole How, you know here let's laugh at their misfortune in the same way as well with the officers I wasn't going oh god aren't the officers absolute bastards so even the governor who is a bit of a sort of Frank Spencer character in terms of his ability to things to go wrong on his watch but at the same time he was doing it with the best intentions he was genuinely trying to make the prison better it just it was failing miserably but not really to his fault because he was just having his funding cut left right and center and you know he 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 just didn't have anything like the resources to keep the prison ticking over in anything resembling sort of a normal functioning prison so it was about the systemic failure that if you cut this much money from prisons it just the problems just get magnified elsewhere um, so yeah, that it, it, it's it, it's it's a more sophisticated, complex thing to sort of try and get your head around than bad person done bad thing punish war, you know, which is the sort of the narrative that we're very used to in this country. I think you're you you painted very um, sympathetic portrayals of of the prisoners and things. It, it it just it was funny, like I say, and it felt like reading Catch Twenty Two or something like that. Um, tell me about that um, Brummy in the first few days. Maybe one of the few people who doesn't come out of it uh, covered in, in glory who wanted to steal your TV. Well, because I, I at that point you were just this complete newbie, fresh face on the wing. So I didn't I know my ass on my elbow in terms of prison, and and he he kept he was trying to borrow the TV and. And I was just trying to sort of make friends with everyone. I've been locked in my cell 23 hours a day. So it was just talking to anyone was kind of exciting. And he was like, can I borrow your TV? And I thought, mm, maybe not. And he said, well, my, my friend's on telly tonight. I need to watch this show because my friend's on TV. And I actually took that seriously. So I went, went to my cellmate, the old sort of hard-bitten guy out of porridge. And I said, oh, the guy next door wants to borrow our TV so he can watch his mate on it tonight. And he was like, what the fuck? <laughs> Of course we're not going to. Of course his mate isn't on telly. If he is, he's on fucking Crime Watch. Look at him. <laughs> I, went, I sort of went, oh, yeah, 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 maybe. maybe. Actually, funny enough, he was a scouser, and I, I changed it because my, my I think my editor was worried about the sort of tarring scousers as all being thieves. But Brummies get it as much. Well, yeah, but I'm from Birmingham. You don't see my oh. accent, but I'm from Birmingham. So I thought, well, I can do that. <laughs> it's like Sasha Van Cohen and the Jews. I can. I'm, it's okay right. for me to not Brummies. Right, you're allowed to do the Brummies. That's funny. Oh man! And then um, your your son Kit. So he was able able to see you every now and then. Uh, but he had to have criminal background checks. How old was he? He was three at the time, and it was weird because my ex Lottie, um, who actually might pop over with him in a minute, but she um, she visited me straight away. She actually got to have a visit with me within about three days, which was fantastic. And but then she couldn't bring Kit in for about five weeks because they kept saying we've got to run these background checks and I'm like he's three I mean they're like yeah we're gonna run these checks and the, so they delayed my son coming in for all this time because of the criminal record checks but they let an adult albeit Lottie also doesn't have a criminal record but they she could just kind of come in and then he couldn't I mean but that's that's just if you start getting annoyed about it you're gonna have a bad time in prison because that was that kind of sort of mindless counterintuitive bureaucracy was just embedded in every part of life and you could either get really upset by it or you could laugh at it. 
And I quite quickly learned to just laugh at it. Otherwise, you just go mad. I'd laugh at it and write it down is what I did. Yeah, well, that kind of bureaucracy. I mean, uh, yeah, it seems like you were well-equipped mentally or better equipped than many to deal with those kinds of things. But not being able to see your son for a, a substantial period of time, especially at that age when they're really growing and changing every time, that can have serious mental health effects. You became what they call a listener and had to, you know, look. And, and there was, you know, somebody killed themselves while you were there, right? And there were all sorts of things. Yeah, Osvaldo I'll, I'll, I'll is who I never met. I don't think I did. But so just to rewind, so a listener, it, it, it's a scheme that was started by the Samaritans about 25 years ago because they realized that, um, it was a real problem for people in prison to call the Samaritans because the phones were all on the wing and there's a hundred other prisoners bustling around making tons of noise. So if you, if you think you might kill yourself because you're being bullied, you're not going to have that call in like a public place. It's like, imagine like at a train station, a payphone at a train station or something, but with everyone walking past and listening in. So the Samaritans realized that it was difficult for prisoners to make telephone calls of a very personal, confidential nature. So they started doing this thing where they got people to volunteer, other prisoners to be volunteered, to be the Samaritans in the prison who could do what the Samaritans do, but do it face to face. And that's what the listener scheme started. And they found out that when they started these schemes in different prisons, the suicide rate went down. So the prison actually, prisons actually started thinking, look, we obviously don't want prisoners killing us, killing themselves. So it now runs in pretty much every jail in the UK. And the idea is, is you as a sort of trusted prisoner do like a month's training. It's quite an intense course. And then you're taken under the wing of ex more experienced listeners. And then you basically do what is essentially in prison counselling. So any other prisoner, any other time of the day or night, if they're feeling suicidal, they want to self-harm or they're just losing it. They can press the emergency bell in their cell, which will call an officer. The officer may or may not turn up, but let's hope they do. And you can say, Gov, I, I need to speak to a listener. And if the officer's in a good mood, then he'll take you to this special cell. They had a special cell on our wing, which is the listener suite, they called it. And then they'd come and get me and say, Chris, we've got someone for you. And I'd go. And the officer would lock us in. So the officer wouldn't come in. It was completely private. But I would be locked in a room with these people. And then they would tell me their story. Um, again, as a journalist, fantastic. And I change all the names in the book and all identifying features. So I don't sort of break any confidence. But, but you would then sit and hear their woes and their worries. And sometimes they wanted to moan. Sometimes they were having like a full-on psychotic episode. Sometimes they genuinely wanted to kill themselves. Sometimes they just wanted to borrow some tobacco or chat about football or something. I mean, you know, you got every, the, the all human life was there, um, basically. It locks you in sort of with, with people who could be having psychotic episodes or could be violent. Who, who were having psychotic. I mean, it's quite obvious. So what, couldn't were you not worried for your safety? There were, there were some hairy moments then. But again, it... It goes back to what I was saying. These were people who have been abandoned by everyone. A lot of the times they've been through the care system. They've been abandoned by their parents, their family. They've been through the criminal justice system. No one was helping them. And every, every single element of the system appeared to be against them. And you're the one person who's like, God, mate, are you all right? Call them by the first name. Sit down, have a cup of tea. Tell me what's troubling you. Oh, that's terrible. I'm really sorry. You're their only friend in the world. You're the only person who's being nice to them. And so some weird self-preservation kicks in that they often thought, am I going to really lay into the one person who's helping me? So th there were some hairy moments, but not many. And you could just, you did get used to it. The thing you learn, and I've since, that's another part of the, the story, is I ended up doing a psychology degree <laughs> through the Open University that I finished a couple of years ago when I got out. And you learn through that, that people who have severe mental health problems are far more likely to be the victims of violence than the perpetrators. So you have this image of the mentally ill person who's on a rampage beating everyone up, and it's actually the opposite. The mentally ill person is much more susceptible to be attacked by others. Did you feel you were helping people? In a sense. I mean, I couldn't give them the help they really needed because what they really needed was, was, was mental health treatment, and that wasn't happening. What they really needed was not to be in prison, and that wasn't happening. What they really needed was to get out their cells more. And, and, and not be addicted to drugs, and that wasn't happening. So I couldn't do the big things, but I could give them an hour of comfort and warmth and some, maybe some laughter and a cup of tea and a, and a shoulder to cry on, which might ease their suffering for a little bit. Um, so, yeah, I do sometimes see it as putting a plaster on a shotgun wound, but sometimes we were the only plaster there was. There wasn't anything else. So, you know, you, you were essentially a, a, an amateur mental health practitioner a lot of the time, because most of the people who came into that room had some severe mental health problem.
And that's why they were there. Were there moments when you needed um, somebody to listen to you or did, when you got very down? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it often came because of the listening. So the listening itself was traumatising because of what you were witnessing and experiencing. I know I said, like, violence is quite easy to get desensitised to in an odd way because it's all quite kind of clinical and it's just people hitting each other. And that sounds ridiculous. But, but hearing someone suffering in a very intimate way which the listening thing was, was devastating because you would hear their stories and you would see, because a lot of the time they were very young. So they were like teenagers, they were 18 year, years old and they were in an absolutely dreadful state. And you just thought you're not going to survive here. And, and you would see how pitiful their sort of situation was and the fact that no one was helping them. And I found that deeply upsetting. So yeah, so I would then sort of need a listener. And I was very lucky that my cellmates I got on very well. My cellmates, they're all still... One of them messaged me earlier, actually. He's in Australia. He just sent me a message with some joking abuse on it. Um, <laughs> and, and, and like, we had that very intense, close relationship. Simply, I'm making a film at the moment about someone who used to be in the army, and he's, de he's described what it's like living in a tank. And I'm just like, God, that's so similar to what it's like being in a prison cell, because you get that kind of condensed, um, shared experience very quickly. And so my cellmates were very good at... Some of them were listeners, some of them weren't, but you would talk about things through with them and you would share your your heartache and and they were they were very very good to me there was also somebody uh i think that was part of the listener stuff that somebody had a had a physical illness or something and th nobody responded for days and they could have died oh that happened all the time i mean it just it just happened to be one of my cell it happened to ha happen to one of my cellmates they had bursitis which i knew nothing about at the time and i'm now an, an expert on bursitis <laughs> he gets this weird swelling sack in his in his elbow and it goes up like a like a tangerine, like, and then an orange. It was just ridiculous. And he'd had it before. He said, oh, I've had this before, so I know what it is. I need to go on a crash course for antibiotics immediately, or I go into septic shock. And, and the prison nurse came around and went, yeah, it's two paracetamol. And he's like, no, no, I'm, 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 I literally might die here. You need no, two paracetamol. Um, and, but people die in prisons all the time just because they haven't got the, the, the medical treatment they need. And when I got out and I was researching the book, I saw all these instances in other prisons and terrible news reports. Bronzefield, I mean, a baby died in Bronzefield. They put pregnant women in prison all the time. And then they, a woman gave birth and the baby died on the floor of the prison cell because the healthcare there is an absolute disgrace. So that level of medieval barbarity was, was sort of happening all the time. Barbarism, not barbarity. But I'll say bar barbarity sounds great. I'm I didn't even notice, but I, I was on a podcast um, that it was like the biggest one I'd been on as a guest. He's got he gets hundreds of thousands, and I kept saying that somebody had been disavowed of something. Which is, you say you're disabused of something, and you disavow something, don't you? And I said disavowed of, and I said it about seven times. I don't know what I never used that word, but I used about seven times, and that's the most I've ever. That's the biggest ever interview I've been on, but. Um, I was going to ask, do you worry sometimes that obviously your, your book exposes obviously a lot of what the prisons and stuff get wrong, but also sort of cheats and things in the system, the way the systems work. Do you worry that by writing about it, you're sort of bringing it to the attention of the officers and stuff, some of the things that the um, uh, the prisoners get away with? I've, I've since spoken to loads of officers since I got out. Um, and if I may mention my own podcast, um, I did a podcast because I had lots of people I'd, I'd spoken to on my journey. A lot of them I met at open prison, so they couldn't go in the book. The book was all about Wandsworth, and they all had these mad stories. And I got all their numbers. They're good friends of mine. And I was just like, wow, they've got these great stories. So when I got out, I started recording conversations with them. And they, I thought, well, I, I'll build this into a book. Because they, they didn't want them to be identified, so I couldn't put them in a documentary. But they said, if you use the deal was I used their real voice and real stories, but I changed their names. And I thought, well, that's perfect for podcasts. Um, so I did a whole podcast series where I, I interviewed about 20 prisoners about their stories and their kind of crazy experiences. And, and then I thought, well, I need to look at the other side. And I'd actually been contacted by officers when my book came out as a hardback. I was getting officers messaging me on social media going, thank you for writing the book. And oh my God, it's, it's really interesting. And thank you. You know, so they were like fans. So some of them I'd message back and, I'd say, look, I'm doing a podcast and I'd like to interview officers. And they were like, yeah, fine. And I think with two of them, they'd left the service because I think they might get in trouble if they were still serving and talking to me on record. So they'd left, they'd just, they'd recently left the service. So they were, they could be quite kind of candid about it. And yeah, there's, there, I had a whole conversations with them. About it, but it was great because we were like, so, oh, I used to do that. Are we, and there's a prisoner here who did that. I think, you know, but the, like one of the things I say in the book is I had two kettles. So my kettle to cook, 
uh, sorry, kettle to boil water in for cups of tea, coffee, which is like all the time. Then you have a second kettle, which is used for cooking in. So we, we had a sneaky second kettle. It's like, well, everyone knows some prisons have two kettles. It's like, do you see what I mean? So it wasn't really exposing that much. It was, I wasn't saying, and here's the name of the officer who's smuggling in the drugs. I just say officers were smuggling drugs. I don't, I don't know which one. So it's, it, it, there wasn't that much. If, if you're an officer, there wasn't that much in the book that would shock you. It's been about three years now, but um, I actually, in, in the pod, in my, in my podcast, I, um, I interview my ex about what it was like coming to visit me with my son. And I, I interview her mum as well about what it was like dealing with my son while I was away. So that I kind of, I, I wanted to see it from the other side. It, was, it wasn't just about my experience. It was like I wanted to approach it from every angle. I'm going to ask you about drugs in a minute. But you know what? Tell me a bit about like where... The, where well, do you want some? <laughs> I'd like some <laughs> spice, please. Uh, some great context. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> After the recording. No, um, but yeah, tell, tell us quickly where people can get your podcast and that. It's called A Bit of a Stretch. The podcast is called A Bit of a Stretch. And it's available on everything. And it's like eight episodes and we look at a different theme. In each episode, um, like Arrival and sort of mental health and the daily grind and um, what it was like during the pandemic in prisons. So when the pandemic kicked off, kicked off, I had friends who were still inside who were calling me, telling me all kinds of horror stories about how awful the pandemic was inside. So I just said to them, look, can I just take this call and put it in the podcast? And the podcast won't come out until you've been released. So you won't get in trouble for talking to me. So they were like, all right. So I've got all these, it's like, you know, Tiger King, because you've got that kind of <laughs> taped calls of, you know, with the beeping and all that stuff. So it's uh, it's done really, it's done, I won an award for something actually. So um, yeah, no, the podcast done really well. That is really cool. And then yeah, your book is the same name, Amazon and all the usual places. Bit of a stretch. Indeed. Right. Tell me about uh, drugs again. Yes. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, you pointed out at one point, I think that people who were in as for pedophilic crimes like sex offense against children often got uh, less and less or shorter sentences than those who are in for drug crimes i mean what is the point in sending people who who have done drug crimes to prison it was the scale of it really that, that there were people i knew who were getting 20 25 years for drug smuggling and it was quite a lot of drugs let's just be honest like kilos and kilos of the stuff but there wasn't any direct violence now you've got to be careful when you say that because there was a lot of violence endemic in the drugs trade and even though they were just these middle class guys who were arranging for kilos to come in and then sell them on to people and they never committed act of violence in their life and never would it didn't mean that further down the food chain once it gets to street level the drug trade does encourage a huge amount of violence so but even taking that into account giving somebody in my view giving somebody 20 25 years for selling 10 kilos of cocaine and someone who had sexually abused a bunch of children, giving them three years, I, it just seemed to me to be completely absurd. Um, so I take my own sentence out of it, but it just that sort of disparity, if you look at the harm against society, especially at a time when, I remember doing the Tory leadership contest, they were all falling over themselves to boast about how they'd all taken drugs, like Boris took drugs, Gove took drugs, Rory was like, I did, I did opium once, you know, Liz Trust did a bomb. I liked Rory. I yeah, I know, Rory and it was right. just like, because they thought they'd sound cool if they experimented within their youth. And I'm saying, well, look, that's great. But at the same time, Michael Gove, you've advocated for these ridiculous drug sentences, while at the same time, you're happily racking up lines in the toilet. So it's it's weird that there's this thing of like, everyone we, every, everyone I know has had taken drugs at some point in their life. Everyone knows someone who's taken drugs. And it's sort of endemic in society. But we have this weird thing with the criminal justice system that the way that we can solve that is by sending people to prison for like a quarter of a century for getting sucked into the trade it's just it's just bizarre where if you say you abuse children you people were getting these derisory sentences and it that seemed to me wholly unjust drugs i'm just thinking about it now and again i don't know anything about economics and stuff but drugs is is another is sort of tax avoidance isn't it if you're selling drugs no tax the government's not getting any money the same with what you did but with pedophilic crimes it doesn't really affect the government's budget no and that's always been my i mean there's a whole other debate about legalization but you could empty prisons if you legalize drugs you would empty prisons and you would take the trade away from organized crime it's the same with prohibition in america you you, you make something illegal it doesn't stop it it just hands it to people at al capone so you think there was a time in America where if you wanted alcohol, you had to buy it from a gangster. You had to commit crime. You had to go through the crime route to get alcohol. And it's insane to think that now. Now it's like Weatherspoons and 
Heineken that did, you know, their proper you know companies on the stock market. So it it, it seems deranged that if, if people want something, they're going to get it anyway. So you might as well legitimize it and tax it. And if you look at what's happening in America, a lot of American states have balanced their books. Some of them are in surplus because they've made their taxing marijuana and, and, and the government's getting a piece of the action. But at the moment, the government's not getting a piece of the action at all. It's it's, it's kind of crazy. They'd make more money. It would surely be a vote winner for, for at least, again, I'm going back to the paedophile thing because it just seems mad they're getting less time than drug dealers and stuff. That was another interesting thing as well, the ultimate sort of virtue signalling. Obviously, when we talk of virtue signalling, we're th- talking about how good we are and stuff. In the book, you talk about prisoners looking down on the paedophiles. They were the they were like the lower thing. Tell me about that. Yeah, there was this weird sort of hierarchy of <clears throat> crime, I guess. And tax was sort of seen as a relatively inoffensive, you know, you, you, people saying what you're in for tax, they'll kind of roll, roll their eyes a bit, really. It wasn't that, which is good. I didn't want anyone to go, why do you steal money from the government? Or they or they say, good on you. Did you did you get a lot? And I say, mm, not that much. And they were like, oh, steal more next time, you know, because th- they saw that as sticking it to the, to, 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 to the, to the state. Um, but but yeah, with sex crimes, they were seen as like at the bottom rung, and it meant that people who were inside for selling drugs or beating people up in the streets <clears throat> could feel better about themselves because they were like, yeah, if I find a paedophile, I'm going to cut them up. And it was just like, you know, but have you ever done anything to the victims of sex crimes when you're outside of prison? Like none of these people would donate to the NSPCC in the real world. And it just seemed like it was only in prison they suddenly got really, really upset about sex offenders when they were inside for putting a bottle in someone's face, which is also, you know, pretty grim. So I suppose it was just a way that people would feel better about themselves and say that there's obviously, you know, I did like some mild crime, but here's really bad crime. And that's obviously not me. So I'm I'm, I'm, I'm a good person, really. Yeah, I find that really fascinating, actually. The way, yeah, even there you can still... Even no matter what you've done, you find the bottom rung. And then, I mean, were you, because also, again, in this, it's movies and stuff, right? But the ones who have done the sex crimes and stuff, they typically say they did tax crimes when, you know, can you prove to other people that it wasn't that kind of, that it, you weren't a sex offender? Yeah, well, I thought, I mean, in a way, it was, it was quite useful because my crime was quite heavily publicised because HMRC made such a big kind of meal out of it. They, um, they were all very proud of themselves. So it was in the sun. And also I spent a lot of my time annoying journalists for the tab- in the tabloid press and my filmmaking. So obviously when I went down, you know, fair is fair. They kind of lambasted me in the, in the, in the newspapers, as is, their, as is their right. And But in a sense, when I went in, people, oh, you're that guy in that film taxing. Yeah, you were in the sun. Everyone reads the sun inside. So I was in page five of the sun. They call me Britain's top film. What are Britain's top filmmakers? So oh. what are Britain's top filmmakers is nice. it done for tax fraud. And I was like, oh, that's all right. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, that sort of let the world know who I was and why I was there. But at the same time, they, they are segregated. So if you're in general population, you almost certainly haven't committed a sex crime because they say to you, do you want to go... Um, to the vulnerable prisoner unit um, and if you've committed a sex crime they, they almost coerce you into doing that because they said look if you go out to general population we don't think we can protect you so you need to go and the slang is nonces so they're called nonces people have been done for sex crimes so there was a nonce wing in Wandsworth and that was completely shut off I, I literally went everywhere in that prison except for the nonce wing because it was just like no general population could get near there because very bad things would start happening yeah your journalistic curiosity you must have wanted to sort of pop in i did meet one by accident because i i and it was my fault i can't remember there's so much in the book that we ended up cutting so i can never remember what was in the book or not but there's one i, I think it's got I can't, I can't remember but there was my job i got a huge amount of responsibility like because <clears throat> so much of the funding cuts had led to a, a massive depletion of officer numbers so there used to be a set ratio of the number of officers per wing to the number of prisoners. But over time, that got cut and cut and cut. So a lot of the jobs that should have been carried out by officers were actually given to trusted prisoners like me. I wasn't complaining, got me more respect, got me out of my cell, got me great content for the book. So I was being given jobs that they'd say, like, an officer used to do that, but you're going to have to do that now. And one of them was when I got to the induction wing, I had to write down a list of the prisoners who had recently arrived on a piece of paper, always on a piece of paper. And I'd hand that list to an officer. An officer would go around and, 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 and let them all out. And they'd come to a little room that I was in and I'd give them these tests. They had to do education tests to assess what the levels of English and maths were. It was something that the 
the prism took quite seriously. It was kind of pointless because so many education courses have been cut, but they, they wanted to test everyone when they came in. And that was my job. And then one day I was there and there was, there was a quite young guy, actually, he was doing his sitting there quite studiously doing his maths test, wasn't causing any problems. And suddenly these two enormous security officers come in. Now, security officers are different because they're dressed like in riot gear. They're, they're always enormous. They're dressed completely in black. They've got visors on. And they're like, if security officers come in, something heavy is happening. And they marched over, picked this guy up and marched him out. And I sort of said to one of the other officers, what's going on? And they said, he's a nonce. Some idiot let the nonce out. And I looked at my list and went, Oh, that was me. <laughs> on C10, I put D10 or something. I, I wasn't paying attention. So I, I let a nonce out by accident. And they were like, you know, people knew what he had done. He wouldn't last five seconds. So that, that was my one contact with the pedophile. Hi, I'm Andrew Gold, former BBC journalist. I got a little tired of restrictions over who I could interview and what I could say and do. So I made this channel. Click this playlist here and I'll be seeing you on the edge.